Okay, so in this battle of integration, let's now focus on the simplicity, because it sounds complicated, but it really isn't. The simplicity and the genius of God's design here. Okay? Truth be free. It's the start. That was episode one of the God Deed series. Truth be free. That was God's decree. If it's not free, it's not truth. Because if it's not free, it's not free to be truth. If it's not truth, then it can't be free. Okay? Therefore, lies are condemned. Therefore, God is not going to create, because he has to create truth. God is not going to create truth to be anything but free. Well, if it's going to be free, then it's going to be all the high and all the low and everything in between. You know, in the, what the math guy would call infinity. Going on forever, all the high, all the low, all the negative, all the positive. And then that is a kind of stasis. If it's all, this is really important, if it all exists, there's not one jot, not one tittle removed from the sequence. If it all exists, then every dot, no matter how negative, no matter how positive, every dot matters. The whole is the sum of the parts, but you can't take out any of the parts, or it's not the whole anymore, and it wouldn't be free. Free means it has to freely exist, everything be what it is. Nothing shaved off, nothing removed. Satan's plan is exactly the opposite. Trim, 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 cut, 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 cut. And leave only what he would call the nice parts. Satan's very nice. People don't get that. He's very, very nice. He wants everything to be nice. So do I. But he's wrong. I'm wrong. God's right. Because truth doesn't have integrity if even one dot is missing. Okay? That's point one. And I'm, I'm, I'm aiming to show the simplicity and genius of God's plan here. Point two. If everything exists, because truth be free, then God is going to associate himself, baptize, meaning onto everything that exists, because everything that exists is going to be less than him. So, you know, it's a justice question in the first part, in point one. Everything must exist for the whole to exist. Not one dot can be removed. Okay, but then the next juridical question is, okay, if you remove a dot, that's obviously wrong, because that's shaving truth. But why should holy God have to put up with something less than him? So here in point two, God answers that question. And this is why we have a cross. God baptizes all of the bad. You know, Christ called it the cross of baptism. Okay? Just search on baptism in your English Bible, in the Gospels. He called the cross a baptism, yeah. And what was a baptism? A baptism, the actual Greek word is baptizo, and it was used by a smithy who was making a sword or other implement, really hot iron, iron and other uh, elements. And it was really, really hot, molten. And you poured it into a mold, okay? But then when it finally settled in the mold, then you had to take it out and dip it in liquid water and other stuff mixed with it to cool and harden the iron or whatever metal was being used okay to dip it to immerse it wholly in the water that was what baptizo meant and it was actually a graduation ceremony used by hoplite soldiers who when they were just out of boot camp they would get their own sword and and this they would they had this big vat full of pig's blood 
and they'd be lining up to get their sword awarded by their trainer or whatever, and they'd, you know, say something like, rah, rah, Greece, you know, it wasn't just Greece because they were city-states, but rah, rah, my part of Greece, and then they'd immerse the sword in the pig's blood to baptize it with victory for battle, you know, because the blood of battle and all that. So that's what baptizo means. Christ was baptized with our sins. Javelin stabs. That's Isaiah 53, 5. You've heard me say it before. Wahu mecholal mepshed. And he, wahu mecholal, was javelin stabbed. Mepeshenu. With our sins. Our rebelling sins, particularly. Pesha means rebelling sin. I'll say it again. Wahu and he, mecholal, was javelin stabbed, mepeshenu, with our rebelling sins. That was a baptism. So God baptized the bad with the good. God baptized the good with the bad. And that's your life every day, too. See the genius? Life is free to be what it is. You are free to be what you are. Good, bad, and different. Thinking about God or not. Doing whatever you do and during the day. But God has baptized every single event, every speck of dust on the highway, everything in life is baptized with a value and a meaning so that it all, even though it all exists, truth be free, it does some kind of job God wants it to do. Now God being omnipotent can do that. It's kind of hard to imagine how he can make good on a dust, a speck of dust on a highway. And it's especially hard to understand how he can make good on the Holocaust. But surely he did. Because who sees it forever? Omniscience. Who sees it forever? God sees it forever. So he damn well better have baptized it all to do good for him. I live on that, baby. I I would kill myself yesterday if I didn't know God was making good on all this. Because I can't stand looking at me. I can't stand looking at anything else. It's like, why the hell do you allow this? How can you stand it? This isn't doing anything for you. All we ever do, we humans, is we spit in your face. And I'm really no exception. If he didn't put Bible doctrine in my head, I couldn't talk about it. And the rest of me is just not fit to live. Ever. So how does he put up with it? I live on that knowledge. He must be baptizing this to his advantage. And every time I pray to him, you know, it's like the highest and best for God, please. I want everything that you say this prayer is, that's the highest and best for you. That's the highest prayer I know how to, how to pray. If everything's going to revolve or resolve to the highest and best for God at all points in time and non-time, then it'll be the best for us. Because once we see Him, we're going to be so in love with Him. That's all we're going to want. So now watch the beauty of this. That, the foregoing, has to be, the, the, you know, the second point has to be the first justice. God would call truth be free the first justice. But for us, we would call the highest and best and God baptizing everything to his own advantage the first justice. And of course, a, a ton of Bible verses supporting that. Romans 8, 28, God works everything together for good for himself. That's what you don't see in the... You can't see that in the English. God works everything together for good for himself. The word he... You, you, you can't, you can't, it's in the accusative case. It means that he's the recipient of the working together for good. Soon or get all. All right, he's the recipient. Yeah, I'm counting on that baby because I don't want to be here. I should have never been born. If you're working everything together for your good, then it's okay that I exist. Okay, well, there's the simplicity of the spiritual life. It doesn't matter what I am. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter if I win. It doesn't matter if I lose. 
It doesn't matter if I'm high. It doesn't matter if I'm low. It doesn't matter if I'm rich or poor. Whatever it is I got right now, that's God's gift to me. And he's making good. He's working it together for good for him. And now it's okay. As long as it's benefiting him, I'm happy. Because if it benefits him, then it benefits me. He's bigger than me. The harder juridical issue is, is it going to benefit him? And it will. And I live on that. I'm sorry, it makes me cry to even talk about it, so maybe I should stop. But that's the simplicity of the spiritual life. Every day you go through your life. You got your favorite Bible verses. My pastor liked to call that faith rest. You got your favorite Bible verses you live on. You got your favorite Bible ideas and principles you live on. Just fire them like a gun at your problems. Fire them like a gun at your suffering. You're making good on this. You're making good on this. Romans 8.28, you're making good on this. And yeah, the passage in context says for those who love God, the implication being that if you don't love God, he's not making good on it for you. Okay, but he's making good on it for him. And you can change your mind and be positive, and then he'll make good on it for you. But he's going to make good on it whether you cha you want him or not. And that's the greatest juridical promise you could ask for. Because the more you know God, the more you can't stand yourself. The more you know God, the more you hate yourself. Because the more you know God, the more you fall in love with Him. And the more you look at yourself and say, well, I shouldn't even exist. Who the hell am I? I'm so ugly and I'm not good enough for you. That's how you have, that's the cross you bear. Is that is that you know you're not good enough and you want to be see you don't need morality when you're in the spiritual life you got another thing that's even far higher replacing it you want to be good for him because you love him that's not morality that's love morality isn't love morality is tit for tat Morality is I do for you and you do for me and we're all in this sterile existence together. whoop de doo Love is an entirely different thing. Love is where the other person, when somebody asks you about you, you think of the other person. And the person I saw of all the candidates running who knows what love is, is Jeb Bush. And then meet Jeb Bush in his own little, little, you know, kind of weird website. The one of the lines there, the one of the click links there is meet Jeb Bush. And the very first line when you click that link, he talks about his wife. She's everything to him. She's the meaning of his existence. Okay, God's the meaning of my existence. I don't need morality now. I'm in love. Love is higher than morality. Way higher. Okay, and that's the point. The simplistic genius of God is love. Love is the integrity of God, my pastor shouted on May 7th, 2000. Just before he got Alzheimer's, God was so gracious. Love is the integrity of God. The theologians have been arguing over what is God's chief attribute for like 2,000 years. Love is the integrity of God. The Calvinists say that can't be true because love is somehow supposed to be sentimental. Not in God, it's not. If God didn't love, there'd be no creation, honey. If God didn't love, there'd be no truth. Think it over. Love is the integrity of God. Love is the integrity of you. Integrity is way above morality. Because morality is always looking for something in return. Morality is founded on tit for tat. Love doesn't care about that. Love just wants to give. But it needs to be smart. 
Well, absolute love would be smart by nature. God's nature is not divisible. We talk about it that way because we humans are divisible. But, you know, God is omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, love, veracity, sovereignty, um, truth, of course, veracity, same thing. Veracity is a quality of being truthful, actually. Um, I might have forgotten. Justice, righteousness, all of his attributes inform all of his other attributes. It's all, it's all blended. So love is smart. Love is righteous. In God, love is just. And therefore love is efficacious. It works. It brings about the desired effect. Just like he says, and what was that? You just threw that at me. Isaiah 54 and 55. Go look those up. The whole chapters. Even though those chapters don't have the word love in them. The word love is not in those chapters. If I recall. Okay? Go look it up. So, you're growing in love. You're integrating in love. Love is Bible doctrine. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a, it's a parent of major you can't see in the English. In 1 Corinthians 12, um, verse 31, he talks about what is surpassing, hyperbole, and it means the head. The head surpasses the body, ha, ha, ha. And then he says, I'll tell you what's surpassing. And that's his passage saying, you know, that love is way above morality. Love is above the body. It's in the head. Because your soul is connected to your brain. And the head is Christ. So Christ is love. And that's what First Corinthians 13 is about. Even the Calvinists know that. Love is the integrity of God. Love is what builds integrity in you. So integrity is what? As I started this audio. Truth be free. If truth is free, you can't remove one dot. It won't be truth anymore. Because it won't be free anymore. Integrity is where you unite all the dots. And that's another theological definition that all the theologians agree on. That God, and this is the wording they use, unites those perfections in himself. Let me say that again. Quote, unites perfections in himself. End quote. Well, that's what integrity does. It's an integration process. And that's what the spiritual life is. So now notice how simple this is. Everything you do, everywhere you go, waking and sleeping, God first. Think of Him first. Just thinking of Him. Ask Him to remind you to think of Him first. Ask Him to remind you to, to think of some kind of Bible concept or Bible verse. No matter what you're doing. What Because life is Bible class. Because Bible class is an integration process. Between what you do with your body and what you do with your soul and what you do in living toward Him. Three-way integration. All the time. 24-7. And it, in heaven, that's how it's going to actually work. The trouble is, is that by the time people get to heaven, most of them have no Bible in them. So they don't have a spiritual lifestyle. They have a spiritual life, but it's empty. You know, they went after religion, or they went after their works, or they went after rituals, and all this other substitute stuff. They didn't go after learning and living on Bible to have a relationship with God. It's not just learning and living on Bible, it's the why. Why have? Why learn and live on Bible? Why sit under a teacher? to have a life with God an active, daily bi-directional, here it is vertical relationship with God 24-7 that's a spiritual life and then God uses that process to sort of answer Satan see Satan, this is why my plan works better this is why, see how this plan makes, you know, brain out happy in spite of all the stuff I'm throwing at her, or you're throwing at her 
and say can't say anything because it's true and you're the brain out and I'm the brain out and there's six billion other brain outs on this planet hopefully they all believe in Christ before they die brain outs the nickname I use for Christian because you don't have your brains once you believe in Christ your Holy Spirit's your only source of brains now that's Ephesians 4.23 in the Greek it's very funny okay so I just want to know you dad what should I be thinking dad what should I be doing dad what should I have for breakfast what should I have for dinner do you like the blue socks or the red socks just just because then you can just associate everything with him and that builds the vertical pipeline of the bi-directional feedback that you're going to need as king and that everybody's going to feed off of once you're king and you know once you're dad if you made it to f finish the course the maturity second what was that second timothy four seven and eight you finish the course you make the kingship everybody's going to feed off you and that's exactly what you want because then their vertical pipelines start to be built start once they're dead because they didn't want it down here but they'll get it there but it'll be so slow a whole bunch of them but so slow everybody getting just a little dot but it's building and you got all eternity keep on building every day is going to be better than the prior And you get to be the source of that for them. You get to be the source of their happiness. And you're the source of blessing now, even before you die. Because you're going through the process. You're going through this vertical pipeline building process. And then you are the pipeline. And then they, your thought flows through them, to them, and they're each getting one drop of it. But at least it's a drop, and it does make them happy. Their standards and ability to process happiness is much smaller than yours. But they're getting it fully for them. And then you get more, you know, the pipeline, the Holy Spirit's going to be running your soul forever at that point. And you have a big soul at that point. So a lot of throughput comes into your soul and goes out to your kingdom. And that's going to make them happy and that's going to be your dream come true and worst nightmare. And it's what you want because it's your cross because he's baptizing you just like he did Christ on the cross he's baptizing you with the kingdom he's baptizing you with the doctrine and the doctrine in the kingdom is how the high and all the low all the truth be free everybody has free will and it works because it's the same structure as down here so it's not a compromise to God now and it's not a compromise to God then to be watching it so that makes your now just as important as once you're dead everything you own everything you have everything you do is your kingdom everyone you see is a, either a stand on or will actually be a subject in your kingdom so practice Pipeline, vertical. What should I be thinking, Dad? Pipeline, vertical. What should I have for breakfast? Pipeline, vertical. Okay, how should I what how should I word this email? What do you think about this wording in the email? Should I wear blue socks or red socks? What do you think about this? Oh, I'm washing dishes. Is there a Bible doctrine I can ponder while washing the dishes? Having a twenty four seven conversation with him. That's heaven. Even down here. Try it.